Welcome everybody to a new session of the Young Machine Learning Needs Mathematical Optimization uh, Seminar Series. Uh, today we have the pleasure of having these three uh, speakers and as usual uh, we will place the question till the end for the three of us, of them, sorry. And uh, now Sinia is going to present them. Yeah, so thank you Christina. Uh, our, our first speaker is um, uh, Radio Sem uh, Sierra de, de Nemeo, sorry for my pronunciation, and she's a postdoctoral researcher at School of Computer Science and Statistics in the Trinity College uh, Dublin. So, Bremia, uh, floor is yours. You have uh, yeah around uh, 70, 20 minutes. Okay. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, everything is great. Yeah. Okay, perfect. So thank you, thanks uh, Sinia for the introduction. And thanks Sinia, uh, Cristina, Dolores and Emilio for organizing this online uh, seminar series. And of course, thanks everyone for, for coming. Well, in this talk, uh, I'm going to uh, presents a work entitled On Linear Regression Models uh, with Hierarchical Categorical Variables. This is a joint work with Emilio Carrizosa from the University of Seville, Laus Mortensen from the University of Copenhagen and from Denmark Statistic also, uh, and Dolores Romero Morales from the Copenhagen Business School. Sorry, Reme, we cannot hear you. Oh, sorry, now? Now, now, yes. Yeah. Okay, so, well, um, in this work, we are interested in uh, linear regression models uh, for a continuous uh, response variable Y, and we are going to consider that in our set of predictors variable, we have continuous predictors as well as dummy variables and they uh, are um, called like um, X prime. And in addition, we are uh, going to consider that we have a special case of categorical predictor variables, which are uh, such categorical predictor that have a hierarchical structure in their categories. Okay, so the first uh, part of the model uh, is related to the, the continuous and dummy variables, and the last part uh, would be the, uh, the part of the model uh, regarding the hierarchical categorical variables. Okay, so this kind of variables, the hierarchical categorical variables, appear in different um, fields of research. Uh, one example could be the spatial statistics with the nested spatial, spatial data. And an example could be the European Union with the nomenclature of territorial units for statistics, uh, where the small regions are consolidated at basic regions, and these turn, in turn are consolidated uh, at major socioeconomic regions. Other example could be uh, in, well, in retail uh, business analytics, uh, since each retail chain maintains a, a product hierarchy, which is necessary to conduct business processes uh, such as store re re replacements. Sorry. Or for instance, in official statistics, uh, with the economic activity data, uh, where the interdependency uh, of activities form a hierarchy also. Okay, in order to visualize, to be better visualize this kind of variables, here we have an example. Uh, we consider the variable geography for the US, and uh, well, this variable can be coded uh, by using the 51 states, which is the highest level of granularity for coding this, this uh, hierarchical categorical variable, or instead we 
can use uh, the, the subregions information, which is Pacific, Mountain, and so on. And um, in this case, we can use only nine categories, or even uh, use the region information, and then only four categories is used uh, to, to code these variables. And this is the uh, least granular representation of geography. Okay, so, uh, well, uh, uh, in this paper, we uh, consider the a tree representation for this kind of, uh, of categorical variables. Then for each categorical, hier hierarchical categorical variable J, uh, we, are con uh, well, we consider a directed tree TJ, uh, which has a root R, uh, then uh, V denotes the set of nodes uh, in the tree, and L denotes the set of leaf nodes. In the previous example, the set of leaf nodes would be the 51 states. Okay. And uh, we have to introduce also a notation for the path uh, from the leaf node L to the root uh, of the tree, which is the set of categories of nodes associated with the unique path in the tree from such uh, leaf node to the root. An example could be, for instance, if we consider the leaf node Washington, the path associated to, uh, or with such a leaf node would be US, West, Pacific, and Washington. Okay, and we uh, uh, build a path for each leaf node in the, in the tree. So, uh, given this uh, notation, now I, I'm trying to um, explain what is the main goal of this work. Well, if we build a linear regression model, the variable geography, for instance, has associated 51 coefficients in the model. Okay, so we wonder if it's possible to fuse, uh, to fuse um, some categories, which is which implies uh, reduce the, the complexity of, of the variable in the model, but without harming much the accuracy. Okay, and we uh, can use the uh, hierarchical structure of the categories to do it. For instance, if the uh, states in uh, East South Central uh, are um, homogeneous, maybe we, uh, we, we can, yeah, uh, include all such states in the subregion information and only consider such uh, in our model. Then, uh, in this work, uh, we propose a mathematical optimization model that trade off the accuracy of the linear regression model and its complexity. And the complexity is measured as a cost function of the level of granularity uh, used uh, for uh, the representation of the hierarchical categorical variables in the data sets. Some advantages of this uh, goal, well, uh, the first would be the interpretability of the model uh, because a fewer number of coefficients uh, has to be estimated. Also, uh, we can reduce the parameter estimation error for the same reason. And uh, other, other um, advantages uh, could be, for instance, in, in this example, uh, that the, uh, we can reduce the data gathering cost. Uh, because maybe we only need uh, samples from the subregions, but not from each state of, of the, of the uh, subregion. So uh, it can be reduced. Or if we take into account uh, data privacy consideration, because it's not the same to give uh, the state information than only the subregion or the region. Well. Okay, so well, no, yeah. So uh, well, reducing the complexity of the linear regression model boils down to choosing a subtree S J of the uh, on all, uh, tree, TJ, for uh, its uh, hierarchical categorical variable. So uh, we want to measure uh, the mean square error associated with such subtree, 
uh, and we uh, measure uh, it's like uh, as, as, as usual in, in linear regression models, uh, the first part, the, the tilde part uh, is uh, related to the, the non-hierarchical categorical variables and the last part of the of the formula uh, is related to the um, hierarchical categorical ones. And in order to measure the complexity of such a uh, reduced linear regression model, we uh, calculate this addition where CJL is the cost associated to the leaf node L in the tree representation for the uh, hierarchical categorical variable J. Okay, so we uh, calculate this uh, in, in this way the complexity of such uh, representation. Then the problem uh, that we want to solve is a bioobjective problem. We want to minimize uh, the, comp the, the accuracy and the complexity, the number of coefficients in the model at the end. Uh, so, in order to solve uh, this problem, we uh, uh, we present a, a collection of constraint problems, and we want to minimize the mean square error uh, subject to the complexity of the model is bounded. Okay, and this C can be uh, given by the user as the the cost uh, associated to each uh, node, or uh, in 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 the in the numerical uh, sample, we, we fix uh, this uh, C uh, in order to yeah to solve a, a real example. So later we will see a, an example of such uh, such value. Then um, we propose a mixed integer convex nonlinear formulation to uh, solve uh, this idea. Uh, we want to minimize, as I said, the mean square error. And uh, we impose of some constraints in order to include the hierarchical structure uh, of the variable uh, in the model. The first set of constraints um, model that only one node is selected per path, becoming thus a leaf node of uh, the subtree sort. Okay, the second set of constraints impose uh, that uh, the, the threshold C on the complexity of the reduced uh, linear regression model. And uh, the, the last part uh, of the formulation uh, are the, well, these constraints impose the range of the decision variables. And well, uh, note that in the last part of the objective function, we have semi-continuous variables. Set is 0, 1, and beta is continuous. And well, in order to solve this, we use uh, big M constraints. Then, in order to illustrate uh, how our methodology works, uh, we are going to consider this uh, real life data set, cancer rec. Uh, this data set aims to predict the continuous variable y, which is the mean per capita cancer mortality. Uh, it has 31 non hierarchical categorical variables and uh, only, well, the, the ge geography variable, which is the hi hierarchical categorical. And uh, in this example, uh, we are going to fix the cost associated to each node in the tree equal to 1, which means that uh, at the end we want to minimize the number of coefficients associated with the hierarchical categorical variable uh, geography in the model. Okay, and we solve the value, the C value uh, is in this set. Uh, we, we set uh, C uh, from 1 to 51, which is the number of uh, coefficient, the possible coefficient associated to, to the hierarchical categorical variable. Solving that, uh, we obtain the Pareto frontier, this one. Uh, the x axis show the mean square error associated to its uh, reduced linear regression model, and uh, the y uh, uh, axis uh, show the number of coefficients uh, associated to such uh, hierarchical categorical variable in the model. If we consider, for instance, these three 
uh, red points. The first one uh, is uh, related to this uh, subtree representation for the geography variable, and here we consider 44 categories. We can see that the mean square error associated to such uh, reduced linear regression model is 0 0.408. And if we um, reduce the categories by half, 21 in this case, and this representation uh, of the variable geography, we obtain a, a good um, mean square error as well. It's very close to the previous one. Or even with only uh, 14 categories, the um, mean square error is still uh, good. So with this example, uh, we can see that much less granular representations can be found at the expense of yeah, slightly damaging the, the accuracy. So uh, we, uh, as conclusion, or to conclude, uh, here we present a new methodology to deal with uh, a special case of categorical variables, uh, hierarchical categorical variables in regression models, and we propose a mixed integer convex quadratic problem uh, with linear constraint to trade off yeah, the accuracy and the complexity uh, of the model. Some extension of this work could be when, when we deal with um, a large number of categories, instead of uh, considering all the categories at once, we uh, can uh, perform a sequential pruning or uh, even um, try to cluster the categories based on a uh, similarity measure in order to uh, you, yeah to have um, a, a fewer number of categories uh, for each that uh, hierarchical categorical variable at the beginning of, of the of the model and um, well I have to say that we have applied this methodology uh, for the objective function of the OLS model, but uh, we can uh, change it and, for instance, for the sake of dealing with a strongly correlated non-hierarchical predictors, we can use the objective function of the elastic nets or um, even by that of the last one, its variance, uh, to also get sparse solution in terms of non-hierarchical predictors. Okay, well, this work is on research gates, so you can find the, the full uh, PDF there. And, uh, well, here you have some references. And my email and all the research grants and projects that has support uh, this this research and thank you very much for, for your attention. Thank you very much, Remy. Uh, so uh, I think we leave uh, questions for until the end. So uh, yeah, so I, I'm going to present the next speaker. Um, our second speaker is uh, Manuel Navarro Garcia. Uh, Manuel is a PhD student at University of Carlos de Madrid from uh, Spain. And uh, Manuel, please, the uh, floor is yours. And we OK, hello. Can you hear me? Yes, everything is fine. OK. So uh, I'm Manuel Navarro Garcia. I'm a PhD candidate on the University Carlos III of Madrid, as you say, and working together with Comorevi AI Technologies, that it's a startup uh, focused on data science and machine learning. And today I'm going to present here uh, a work that uh, I have done joined with uh, Vanessa Guerrero and Maria Durban called Mathematical Optimization Approach to Constrain Smoothing and Actor Rate Prediction. So, uh, in many research areas, uh, we want to study the relationship between a continuous predictor uh, and a response variable. And here, a smoothing plays a, a leading role because it reduces noise, so it allows us to detect patterns. It predicts trends on the data, like uh, seasonality, but also interpolates missing values uh, in the region where we fit the data. However, in many situations, 
uh, we need to impose uh, additional shape requirements to, to these curves, such as uh, controlling the sign of the curve, for example, to be non-negative or non-positive, or in any derivative of the curve, for setting values that the curve of any de or any derivative must attain, for example, to impose that a growth rate of the curve at a certain point has to be above a certain threshold, or when we have group data, uh, we want to monitor the interaction between these curves. Of course, uh, this requirement has to be met in the observed domain and out of rate prediction. So, uh, I'm going to present here two motivational examples. The first one is the evolution of number of fatalities in Spanish regions uh, published by El País, which is a Spanish new paper last October. And we uh, can see uh, in the first row, the third picture in Aragon, that uh, although all the, the values, the observed values are not negative because it's the number of fatalities, uh, the curve attains negative values, and this is not acceptable. Another motivating example can be forecasting mortality rates. Um, here we have uh, the mortality rates for different ages. Mortality rates are the uh, death, the, the number of deaths scaled by the size of the population, and we want that uh, larger mortality rates correspond to older ages. But when we make the forecast, we see that the, uh, the mortality curve of the 69 years old crosses the, the one of the 68 uh, years old. And this is not biologically acceptable. So in this work, we address the problem of constrained smoothing and out of risk prediction in the context of univariate regression with uh, continuous predictors Combining, uh, combining two, two paradigms. First, adaptive mod uh, additive models, in particular p-splines, used to estimate the function, and uh, semi-definite programming uh, used to handle the non-negativity constraints. So, first, what are p-splines? Uh, in p-splines, we will assume that the unknown function we want to estimate is approximated by this uh, linear combination of real coefficients aj, aj and a, a b-spline basis of cubic b-splines over a certain knot sequence, which is a non-decreasing real sequence. And we can see here a b-spline basis with evenly spaced knots that uh, the position of the knots are in the vertical lines. And for example, if we fix here on the red B spine in this element of the basis, this is a, a piecewise cubic polynomial function with joint in a differentiable way. And as we can see here, they are a boundary supported. So imagine that we have gathered n realization of the sample and we order the sample in a non decreasing way. The question is how many knots we use to define the knot sequence and the most, the more difficult task, where do we locate them? P-spline uh, takes evenly spaced knot sequences ranging from one to k plus seven. I will uh, enter in this in a moment where k is the number of intervals in which the domain of the data is split. And we choose uh, this k much lower than the number of the observation. And we said that the first, uh, the, the, the fourth uh, knot corresponds to the minimum value of the regressor vector and the k plus fourth knot to the maximum of this uh, regressor vector. Why to choose a k plus seven and not k plus one knots? Well, if we choose k plus one knots, we will end in the left image where not all the PS plan bases are, have the same shape, and we will have to put uh, different weights in the PS plan bases. If we choose uh, to put three knots at the left and three knots at the right, and three because we are using cubic uh, PS planes, all the bases in the fitting region uh, will be the same. That it's free, uh, com computationally speaking, and we will do that to avoid undesired edge effects. So, uh, 
the coefficient aj we want to estimate are soft uh, so this uh, with this objective function that has two terms the left term is the least of square criterion and the right term it's a uh, composed by a smoothing parameter greater or equal to zero that needs to be to be two this is the pay we this is the price we pay for evenly spaced nodes times a, a discrete a penalty of second order penalty that approximates the second derivative of the curve to gain a little insight of this objective function let's uh, set some values of the of lambda if lambda equals to zero we will have the least square criterion so we will overfit the data in most of the cases and when lambda tends to infinity we will need that the the second term the uh, it's equal to zero to minimize the objective function so the second derivative of the curve will be zero and we will end up with a a, a line that is to say the least possible wiggly curve and we will in, in most of the cases underestimate the data here we can see uh, in the upper um, figure when lambda is equal to zero with with no penalty that we are uh, overestimating the data and we when we uh, impose this penalty and choose a right para a lambda parameter then the result is pretty is pretty good so what if we want to um, forecast uh, predict new values outside of the range we gather the data for example imagine that we have uh, some uh, predictor values to the right of the fitting region we, we defined previously uh, we can extend the knot sequence that we defined before by adding uh, some extra knot that has to have the same uh, step length as, as before and we will add knots until the new fitting region it's inside of the in the range of the knot sequences here we we have a extended ps prime basis where where the the red vertical line it's the the end of the fitting region and we complete uh, in solid gray lines the uh, ps planes that we uh, started before and if necessary we construct new ones and as we can see in dashed uh, black lines and how predicted values should be treated in in this setting we will follow the same approach as Curry and, and Carvalho by treating the values to be predicted at missing values that is to say we will assign a zero weight to the missing values and a one a, a weight equal to one to the values that were observed so we will end up with a very very similar uh, objective function with two main differences: that now we will have more knots and we will have to implement this uh, this way this uh, here in the first part so uh, now we have to impose the constraints let's review the start of the art of non-negative constraint ps planes the first ninth approach we can take is to constrain to constrain the coefficients aj we want to estimate to be non-negative because ps planes were non-negative so this linear combination will be non-negative but it's pretty simple um, the, uh, some researchers um, impose sufficient but not necessary condition on higher derivatives for example Boyertz and P and Wood um, made a reparameterization of the basis and the penalty terms and Mayer um, used a weighted projection onto the polyhedral convex cone uh, and she attains a equivalent relation for certain degrees of of the of the basis on the mathematical optimization framework monteiro et al uh, developed a quadratic programming and semi-definite programming approaches but smoothness in this case depends on the number of the position of the nodes and uh, after that Pap and Alizadet and she and Alizadet developed a semi-definite programming uh, formulation 
with non-negative P splines, but with these undesired edge effects we described before. And to our knowledge, none of uh, no previous work in the literature was able to solve the problem of constrained out of range prediction. So, how can we characterize non negativity? Well, we know that if we have a polynomial that is of even degree, this polynomial will be non negative if and only if this is an equivalence relation, if there exists a, a semi definite matrix such that we have this relation. And this, using some uh, variables, was developed in Versimas and Popescu. So, an uh, arbitrary polynomial, it doesn't matter if it's now if of even degree or not, it's non negative in a finite interval if and only if there exists a semi, semi definite positive metric such that we have these equations. On the left part of the equations, we have uh, the sum of some elements of the semi-definite matrices. And on the right side, we have either zero or either a, a product of the coefficients of the polynomial and some weights. So recall that I, at every interval, we have four uh, BS plane bases that are non-zero, as we can see here in the central, central uh, interval. And each of them, it's a cubic polynomial, as it has the form of this with j uh, as the, the coefficients. Then the function to estimate will be a cubic polynomial of this form. Then we can the the non-negative uh, smoothing p splines as this semi-definite uh, pro uh, problem with a quadratic uh, objective function where um, this W uh, has the, the weights of the Bersimas and Popescu theorem. J uh, corresponds to the coefficients itself of the basis, and uh, the matrices H are auxiliary matrices to, to have the left-hand sides of the inequalities. The forecasting uh, framework is really, really similar. We substitute here the objective function by the out of prediction objective function, and then we have uh, to extend this to the to all the new the not. This can be extended to a large variety of problems. For example, non-positivity or a uh, the function to be estimated to be above or below a, a fixed threshold, but also on the derivatives because B splines are a different differentiable, so we can derivate this uh, this unknown function. So non-decreasing convexity are examples of a constraint that we can derive from here. But also in group data, imagine that we have G curves that we want to estimate simultaneously, uh, belonging to different groups. And we want that this uh, curve do not overlap. Well, we can constrain that the difference of consecutive curves are non-negative. Let's see some numerical examples. Uh, all the optimization models will run with Mosaic under Python, and Lambda was chosen uh, as the minimizer of the generalized cross-validation criteria. For example, in this simulated example, uh, the the black curve we see here it's non negative but when it's uh, added to some gaussian noise we see that the fitting the constrained fitting curve the green one is negative near one uh, 125 however when we impose non negativity over all the all the intervals we see that this uh, this constraint avoids the curve to be uh, negative at any point. Uh, in the previous example we have seen before of forecasting mortality rates, uh, rates, we see that if we impose that the curves cannot cross over, we see that now the curves cannot cross over neither in the fitting region nor in the forecasting region. And now uh, to, to finally address the problem of, of the COVID, uh, um, of the COVID number of infections, 
we can impose non-negativity both in the fitting region and in the forecasting region and predict, for example, imagine that we are, uh, have seen an increase in, in, the, in the number of infections and we have the information of the first wave, we can set a number, uh, a range of models to implement the information on the first wave to the second. For example, if we don't add any information, we will have the blue line. If we said that the derivatives on the second wave will be double the first wave, we will have the brown one. The, the pink one will be the derivatives double the first wave and adding a, a time a one day time lag. And the, the, the green one, it's for illustrative purposes only. Uh, so, conclusions. The problem of, of estimating a small curves in the univariate regression, satisfying certain requirements about the sign uh, monotonicity curves on relative position has been successfully addressed for an arbitrary degree of the, of the basis. An approach based of PS plane based uh, place plane estimation under a semi-definite programming mathematical optimization approach has been developed. Our methodology, uh, our methodology is suitable for constrained out of range prediction for the first time, as the authors are aware. And this uh, framework is flexible to incorporate use of knowledge. And what's next in the ongoing work? Well, multi, multiple regression model. However, as Hilbert himself asked, uh, it is not possible to, to know if a given multivariate polynomial that is non-negative over the real numbers can be represented as a sum of squares and semi-definite matrices on rational functions. Our approach consists of imposing the constraint just on a finite set of curves. For example, in, in this picture, on the red curves of the, of the surface. So uh, we are extending this uh, M dimensional to M dimensional surface, that is to say, to multiple regression models which satisfy shape constraints. Uh, we are preparing a public study library in Python that will include all the examples and implementations in the multi in the multidimensional framework. That I hope that the first version will be out very very soon. And in the future world, we can incorporate variable selection. It will have multiple variables or exploring other loss criteria or non-Gaussian errors. And that's all. This is my, the, the references I, I added in the, in the presentation. And here uh, I, I encourage you to, to look at the, the preprint in research gates of, of our work. Thank you. Thank you, Manuel, um, for your great talk. So um, we, as before, left leave uh, questions to till the end, and now it's time for our third speaker, uh, James uh, Fitzpatrick. I hope I pronounced correctly. Uh, James is a PhD student at Queen School of Business, uh, University College Dublin in Ireland. And uh, please, James, floor is yours. Thank you. Okay, so yeah, uh, hi, my name is James. Um, I'm supervised by Dr. Paula Carl and Dr. Deepak Ajwani, also from University College Dublin. And uh, I'm just going to give a quick overview of the work that I did relating to uh, our approach to using machine learning to help us solve the traveling salesman problem. Um, so, uh, if we can figure out how to move to the next slide. Yep. Uh, so basically the contributions of this work that we did um, were in particular to take um, uh, supervised learning uh, models and use them to help us reduce uh, traveling salesman problem instances. And I'll explain exactly what that means um, in a second. Um, we did this by expanding on previous works to um, get us better results in terms of uh, problem reduction and also to provide uh, optimality guarantees on those reduced problem instances in terms of uh, what we can do when we try to solve them. Uh, we propose new features that are uh, cheap to compute, uh, cheap and easy to compute. And uh, we show that when we actually try to use this in practice, we can reduce uh, the difficulty of our problems, or rather we can reduce the number of variables in our problem instances that we test this on by 85% uh, in most cases. 
and uh, this approach that we've developed um, we've done in a way that we can also uh, use to help us solve other writing type problems and um, I'll talk about that at the end as well. So uh, just, I won't go over this too much, but just as a kind of refresher and a reminder of exactly what the TSP is and how we formulate it as an intro program. Um, the basic idea is that on the right hand side, we have a depiction of some kind of graph and this graph has a property that all of the edges in it have some kind of weight associated with it. And what we want to do is take this graph and find a tour in it of least cost. So this might be an example here in uh, depicted in the kind of yellowy gold color uh, of the edges that belong to some particular tour. Maybe it's the optimal one. And the edges that are depicted in black are the other edges in this complete graph that uh, don't belong to uh, this tour that we've identified. So when we formulate this as an integer program, typically the way we do it, or one of the easiest ways to do it is to formulate it um, whoops, uh, using the uh, Danzig, Fuchs and Johnson uh, integer programming formulation. And uh, for that, what we do is we take each variable or each edge in a graph and associate a variable to it. And in our solution, uh, that variable will take a value of one if um, it belong, if the associated edge belongs to our solution, and it will take a value of zero if it doesn't. Um, so that sounds all pretty simple, but uh, what happens is when we try to solve these problems, we have an exponent, exponential number of possible solutions that we can uh, come up with in terms of uh, those binary variables. Uh, so the more vertices and hence the more edges that we have in our problem, the more difficult it is to solve. And although we have very effective solvers for these uh, particular problems, uh, as they grow, they still get quite difficult uh, for us to solve. So before I move on to how we actually solve them, I'll try and reframe how we actually solve these problems uh, a little bit in, in, in a slightly different manner. Um, we can think about the identification of a solution for the TSB as somewhat of a classification problem. So again, we have this graph. Uh, the yellowy gold uh, edges are the ones that belong to, let's say, the optimal solution in this case, and the black ones are the ones that don't. We can think of these as a positive class and a negative class. And in the classification problem, that's all we want to do. We want to separate the set of edges that belong to our optimal solution into this positive class and the ones that don't into our negative class. Now, in this case, this would be an extremely difficult optimization problem because if we try to solve this, or sorry, classification problem, because we can try to solve it uh, like this, what we want to do is make sure that not only are the correct number of edges in this set um, n, but also that uh, these edges actually form a feasible tour. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to still split our optimization problem, or rather the variables of our optimization problem into two sets, uh, but we're going to take a different approach where we try to um, remove as many of these as possible, uh, edges as possible, and put them into this set m. But we're not going to look for all of the non-optimal edges, just as many as possible. And the ones that we find are very unlikely to belong to an optimal solution, we'll put them here. And the ones we think that might be likely or somewhat likely to be in an optimal solution, we'll stick them into this set here. So this set might be larger than the set of all optimal but hopefully um, every optimal edge and maybe only a small number of the edges that should be in here will be in this set. And then what we'll do is try to solve our problem. So this approach is basically called uh, graph sparsification um, and it's been used in a bunch of other contexts um, to do similar things for other uh, combinatorial optimization problems. Um, so in particular, what we usually try to do when we solve a problem with integer programming like this is to find the optimal solution from our solution space. So every dot here um, is indicative of some kind of solution within our solution space. And I'm going to pretend that this is an image of our solution space. And the integer programming approach would get us, hopefully, if we dedicate enough time and resources to it, to our optimal solution. And if we don't want to do that, and we want to maybe take less time to do that, and we're happy enough to get non-optimal solutions, maybe we use a heuristic that gets us uh, solutions in this subset of the solution space here. Our approach is slightly different. What we do is we first cut off this large section of the solution space by uh, fixing these variables, as, as, as I'll show. And when we actually go to look for our solution, we have this much smaller space to contend with and hopefully uh, a much easier time trying to solve our problem. So uh, if I pretend this is a complete graph here, uh, this comes down to uh, looking at our uh, underlying graph for a traveling salesman problem and fixing as many edges as possible. So basically what we do is we just say we no longer are interested in these edges and we want to look at these edges uh, that are remaining in this new graph and hopefully uh, solve that problem. Um, and this is kind of a bad picture actually because this particular case there's actually not uh, any traveling salesman uh, problem tour. There's no TSP or valid TSP tour in there. But um, the point is that we try to do this. And um, explicitly what we have to do is for each of our edges, uh, ij, so they go between vertex i and vertex j, we want to construct some kind of feature. And hopefully that feature tells us some useful information about that edge because we need to have useful information to be able to do our classification. Once we have 
um, this feature set. Uh, what we want to do is train some kind of supervised learning model. Um, so we want some kind of classifier. Uh, basically, we find um, an interesting classifier that suits our needs, um, get it to output some kind of probability of whether or not that edge belongs to an uh, optimal solution set or not. And um, that's how we construct M. So M is just the subset of those edges uh, in our original edge set, such that the probability that it, or likelihood, I guess, that it belongs to uh, an optimal set crosses some threshold. Or rather, uh, this is the opposite. Uh, what we do is we separate into M those edges that we find with high likelihood are unlikely to belong to our optimal edge set. And obviously then um, the uh, set of the edges that are likely to belong, or more likely, I should say, to belong to our um, optimal edge set um, is just the complement. So when we formulate uh, our optimization problem, or our TSP, using the Danzig, Fuchs, and Johnson formulation, it looks uh, like this. Um, so these are the normal um, constraints that we have. And the ones that we're interested in, in particular are these ones outside the box, which still belong to the optimization problem. And these are the integer constraints. Effectively, what we do is just replace this. Uh, we first of all say that uh, these edges, which we know belong to the set um, uh, of ones that are likely to belong to an optimal solution, we still say they can be and they can take values of either zero or one, so they're still binary variables. But the variables that we know are unlikely to belong to an optimal solution are fixed to zero. So uh, in a situation where we do well, uh, what we have is this set is much much smaller than the other set. So we have many many variables fixed and not that many left to work with. So. Um, once we decide that we want to build those features, we have to find out uh, how to actually do that. Um, one of the most obvious ways, and I guess uh, easiest ways to try and build features that tell us something about how uh, likely an edge is to belong to an optimal set is to look at the edge cost or the edge weight and compare it to those in its local neighborhood. So we might take, uh, for example, well, we'll do this for every edge in the graph, but we'll just look at this one, for, for example, uh, the edge that goes between A and B. Uh, we have some variable associated with that. Uh, we designate with, with x uh, sub a b. And what we do is we take this uh, edge and compare its weight with those in its neighborhood, maybe uh, those incident with b. So these green ones here, we compare it to these. And maybe it's just a, something as simple as a division, a norm, and we normalize that somehow. And we might compare that with those of uh, the neighborhood on the opposite side as well, so those incident with a. And we might also take that edge weight and compare it with uh, some global properties of our graph, which might be described by, for example, something like the maximum edge weight that we see in our graph, or maybe the um, mean or the minimum edge weight. And that should hopefully give us a good idea of what these uh, edges look like in comparison to the rest of the graph. And that should help us to discriminate them a little bit. But it's obviously not enough, because if that was enough to solve our problem, then this would have been figured out a long time ago, and we'd be able to solve our TSP without that much trouble. So we have to construct something a little bit more um, complex in this to make our discrimination a little bit uh, more effective. So um, one of the features that we build um, is it's pretty much influenced and kind of inspired by the fact that for a lot of, um, or for two of the, I guess, the, the main approximation algorithms that we use for symmetric Euclidean TSPs, um, we have to construct minimum spanning trees. Um, and they tell us um, interesting things about the properties of our graph. So basically, to construct these features, all we do is we look at our graph. And again, just for the purpose of this presentation, I'm going to pretend that this is a complete graph. Um, and we compute a minimum spanning tree. So we find the edges that belong to um, this tree here. And then what we do is we construct a new graph as well. And this graph has the exact same vertices as the original graph, uh, but none of the edges. And what we're going to do is once we've uh, computed that first tree, um, we take the edges that are in this tree and place them into our new graph. And we'll repeat this process, but only after we remove these edges from the original tree. So we remove them from the original or the original graph, I should say, and then we compute a new minimum weight spanning tree. And we repeatedly do this, so we've reached some kind of computational budget that we're happy with. And what we end up with is a graph on the right-hand side with um, much fewer edges, hopefully, than the one on the left. But those edges should tell us a good bit about the structure of our graph. And what we'll do is once we put them into our uh, graph on the right-hand side, uh, depending on the order in which they go in, we'll weight them accordingly. And that will tell us something about how important they were, uh, at least relative to each other as well. Um, so what we can do as well is build features by solving slightly easier problems, or well, significantly easier problems on the TSB. So again, this is just, this image on the left is just for purposes of demonstration. It kind of depicts an integer programming problem where we know the solution already. It's this um, purple X we have in the middle. And um, maybe we have some constraints that are known. 
And a typical way to make these kind of problems easier to solve is to do some kind of relaxation. And one of the easiest ones we can do is a linear relaxation where we just drop the integrality constraints on our on our binary variables and we solve our problem. And we might get something that looks like this purple, or I'm sorry, this green dot here. Um, and hopefully that might tell us something about our optimization problem and the structure of that optimization problem. Now, if we use the Danzig, Fulkerson, and Johnson formulation of our integer programming problem for the TSP in particular, um, it's known that this can be quite far away from our optimal solution. So it's not likely it'll be telling us a whole lot about our problem. So rather than just take the information we get from the solution, which would be uh, non-integer values for all of the different variables, what we'll do is do something slightly better. We'll solve this once. Uh, this will be the initial um, node in the branch and boundary. And we'll look at the solution and inspect it. And maybe we see that we can uh, add in some uh, sub elimination constraints. And in fact, maybe we might even have the optimal solution. And that does happen in some cases. And if we do, we can just stop right there. We don't need to do uh, any more when we've solved the problem. But if we don't, then we can keep uh, doing this process again until we reach some kind of computational budget. So we might add in several cuts, uh, hopefully um, something in a process that's not too expensive. And when we're satisfied that we've done this enough times, we'll look at this solution here. Uh, which again uh, will hopefully have non-zero values for quite a few of the uh, the variables in our optimization problem, and hopefully those values tell us something about uh, what the structure of our optimization problem is, and hopefully uh, how likely each of those individual edges associated with those variables are to be uh, involved in an optimal solution. And if we want to have more non-zeros in uh, this feature as well, instead of maybe taking the solution to this uh, easier problem, what we might do is just take the reduced costs and normalize them. So these features, once we construct them, theoretically allow us to um, solve our problem. So what we can do is construct our feature set based off uh, the features I just described, train some kind of model, assuming that we know which edges belong to the optimal set and which don't uh, for this training set that we assume that we have. And then we use our classifier to sparsify our graphs, remove as many variables as possible, and then hopefully we have something that looks nice. Except there's one more thing that we have to take into account, and that's making sure that once we actually do this, that our graphs look right. And by that, I mean, when we have a TSP, um, it's actually common enough that we can have several optimal solutions. So maybe we have a TSP like this graph here on the left, and we have this optimal solution depicted here in, again, yellow and kind of gold. Um, perhaps that's one solution, and perhaps we have another one that looks a bit like this. Um, so if we actually look at the optimal solution set, we see that uh, it, it's a little bit bigger than just um, the minimum number required to make a tour. Um, and what we want to do is in an ideal scenario, uh, sparsify the graph with our just trained classifier that we trained using our features just now uh, to look like this. So we remove only the black edges, the ones that don't belong to any optimal solutions. And then when we try to solve this, we have an easy time and um, nothing's too difficult anymore. Uh, but in practice, that's not what happens. Uh, what actually happens is something closer to this. And this is a really extreme case where we've removed a lot of the edges and we've removed quite a few of the optimal edges and we've removed quite a few of the non-optimal edges. But fortunately, when we remove them like this, we've actually created a situation where the resulting problem that we would solve is not a feasible uh, problem. So we can't get a feasible tour here, here even if it's far from optimal. Um, so a way we can fix that really easily, uh, because if we wanted to check that we can't have a tour here, that itself is a difficult optimization problem. Uh, what we can instead do is look for a tour that we do know and insert it into the graph. So it doesn't even have to be a good tour. As long as we insert any tour into this graph, uh, what we can do is guarantee that there is a solution that we can find here. And that uh, solution might actually be better than the one we provide, depending on the edges that were left behind in the graph. If we do this with an approximation algorithm, that's how we provide bounds to the quality of our optimal solution. So as long as we uh, have an optimal solution, sorry, an approximate solution with known bounds on its optimality, then we also have known bounds on the optimality of the resulting proven problem instance. So we can make some guarantees about the quality of the solution that we can get once we do all this work. Uh, if we don't have access to nice approximation algorithms, we can instead insert random tours if we can do that, or even just ones that we get from a heuristic. So usually we can guarantee some level of quality with these kind of solutions, uh, these kind of pruned instances. So that's the kind of general idea about how we go and do this. But then in practice, I guess it's the more interesting part. Um, so the first thing that we focus on is that we have relatively small data sets. So 
like I said in the previous slide, um, what we might have is a situation where for each of our uh, TSP instances that we want to look at, we have several optimal solutions. And again, the problem here that we're trying to solve is one where we classify the set of non-optimal edges from uh, optimal edges, those edges that never belonged to an optimal solution to those that do belong to an optimal solution. So that means we have to solve our TSPs several times to get the labels which tell us which uh, edges belong to those sets or not, uh, because we might need to get several optimal solutions. So um, if we're going to get label data, we need to make sure that we can actually do it in a reasonable amount of time. So to do that, um, obviously our ability to do that again is not only limited by the fact that we have several uh, problems to solve several times, but also the problems themselves might be extremely difficult. So what we want to do is focus on a benchmark set that we know is small and that we know the problems aren't tremendously difficult to solve. And we'll hope that once we do that, uh, we can generalize well to a setting where we have more difficult problem instances and hopefully larger problem instances. So the benchmark set that we uh, rely on is the Matilda instances. Um, so here we have um, seven classes of 190 instances each, uh, but thankfully there are only 100 city problems. Uh, so that means there are 100 vertices in each one. Uh, and for something like Concord, uh, the Concord solver, these are extremely easy to solve, at least for the most part. Um, and what we'll do is only train on the difficult benchmark instances within that problem set. So and some of them are known to be more difficult than others. Uh, and from our own experimentation and from uh, indications from other uh, works, we've seen that uh, actually uh, training on these instances leads to better, genera uh, better generalization later on. So we don't even train on the entire set uh, that we have here. Um, then when we do testing, we test them on the more famous TSP lib uh, instance set. Uh, so these range from 17 vertices to um, much more than this. I think it's 89,000 uh, vertex problems. We test um, our instances uh, on it or our classifier instance between 17 and 4,432 uh, cities or vertices. Uh, and these have vastly different distributions of weights than the training set. So the training sets are basically generated using um, random generation techniques. These vary from uh, strikingly similar ones uh, to geographic uh, problems to drilling problems, which have a very uh, regular structure, which are completely different. And um, they do pose a problem for these kind of approaches to solve. Uh, and of course, um, since we add these three extra steps to solving our optimization problem, we need to make sure they're all quick. So we need to make sure that the features we compute are cheap, which we've done. We need to make sure that when we train the models, uh, sorry, that when we uh, do inference, uh, that that's quick, uh, because we have to do inference for every single edge independently, which could be a very large number, especially if the graph is huge. And also, uh, we need to make sure that uh, when we do the feasibility checks, uh, we need to use uh, quick algorithms that help us get uh, quick solutions. Uh, so in this case, for the TSP, um, the Christophides and the double tree approximation algorithms are nice and quick, and we can use them to get us to a somewhat reasonable and uh, guaranteed uh, value on our optimization uh, problems, op optimal objective, once we reduce it. OK, so James, that's... Sorry. Uh, James, one yeah. minute left. Uh, so. <laughs> Uh, yeah, if you can oh, uh, be quick in one minute, so yeah. Yep. Okay. So um, I will skip ahead then two slides. So basically, um, the main thing we want to show is that when we use this to uh, solve, um, or when we use this to reduce our optimization problems, um, uh, in particular for the TSP lib uh, data set. Uh, we see that when we do that, actually in 92% of cases, we have uh, an optimal objective in the uh, pruned instance. So that is the optimality, the, op the optimal objective value uh, of the pruned instance divided by the optimal objective value of the original instance, which means that we, we made the problem easier to solve, but didn't lose any optimality in doing so. And uh, in the worst case, we go above about 10% away from the original optimal solution. Uh, but in general, the performance tends to be uh, quite good. And we use relatively simple models, again, just a linear support vector machine and a logistic regression. Um, skip ahead. Um, we can do that with um, pruning rates, uh, basically uh, the number of variables we reduce um, by up to 94 percent 90, uh, in uh, the Matilda problem instances and almost up to 95% uh, in the uh, TSP lib problem instances. So I'll skip ahead and just try and plot that to show that uh, when we um, plot the order of the problems, this is the size of the problem instance against the pruning rate, um, we see that um, Generally, the larger the problem is, the more edges that we can remove, and the colors indicate um, how far we are from optimality, so the bluer they are, the better. Uh, and there's no real um, relationship between the size of the problem and the um, optimality that we get. So the larger the problem is, um, 
or for large problems, this tends to generalize well, which is a main concern because uh, with deep learning methods in particular, uh, which have been used to solve the TSP, uh, we get very poor generalization as the problem size grows. Um, so uh, just let me just summarize, I guess, but um, where we would like to go next is to improve uh, the feature computation to make it a little bit more efficient. Uh, leverage multi-stage sparsification. So rather do this in one step, uh, sparsify a little bit each time, and hopefully make this um, cost a little bit less in terms of computation, and also uh, get us better performance in terms of the optimality ratio and the um, the actual number of variables that we remove. We want to integrate branch and cut features that are hopefully a little bit more expressive. The most important thing of all is develop this approach further for vehicle routing problems where the utility will be greatest and we don't have solvers like Concord that can help us uh, solve these problems really quickly. So we want to use it to try and increase the utility of vehicle routing problems posed as two index integer programming problems. Okay, sorry I ever pursued that, but uh, that's it and thank you. Okay, thank you very much, James for your talk and well we have now some time for questions for any of the three speakers if you want to ask something you can type it on the chat or maybe raise your hand and i give you permission to to unmute yourself and put your camera on if you want Can I break the ice? For, oh, there is a question actually. So okay. to, it's a question to James. Uh, how do you handle the di different dimensions of the graph uh, in your machine learning model? Janice, if you want to, um, to ask. Yes, hello, can you hear me? Yes, great. Yes. Ah, perfect. Thanks. Uh, so maybe I missed it, um, but so so you can have if you have it. So if you train your model on a small graph, um, then somehow you you want to solve the same problem on larger graphs. So how do you adjust your model, or do you predict each edge by its own? Yes, um, this is one of the things that um, possibly could be improved in further iterations, but at the moment, each edge is predicted independently. So that's uh, why we rely on very simple models, or at least ones that have relatively simple inference techniques um, to do this for us, because if we have to uh, predict for a large number of edges for maybe something like uh, graphs with 10,000 or more uh, nodes, that means we have a lot of time dedicated to inference. Um, so each edge is computed independently and the feature representation size should always be the same uh, it just means we dedicate more time to doing the inference okay thank you okay thank you can i ask manuel about uh, his uh, presentation so my question is um i don't know uh because uh, in the end, I realized that you have only one um, explanatory variable, but um, in general, how do you think that, and is, uh, is it possible to apply a method for autoregressive uh, process when your explanatory variable is a log of your response, for example? Mm, yes, yeah, you can you can take the, the continuous variable you want. So if you take the, the logarithm of your variable, you you can have this as a predictor variable. No, you, you will take the logarithm of the of the response variable, I think. Yeah, so, it, it's not logarithm, it's log. It means that we can see the uh, past uh, observations of like one year ago for predict uh, cur uh, current uh, response. Ah, yeah, the, the, the examples I, I, I used are uh, time series but you can do backwards a uh, prediction extending the the bs plan basis on the other side i, I just uh, use the forward prediction because i think it's more intuitive but the the methodology is the same in in both questions okay great thank you okay are there any more questions Actually, I have one question to Reme. Um, so uh, my question is because I, I see that you can uh, uh, reduce the granularity of uh, the um, 
hierarchical uh, categorical variables but what if you apply this approach so you build this uh, tree based on the continuous variable for example age and then you can in the end choose let's say more in informative age groups or so yeah can I yeah talk? i see your point yeah uh, in fact we have an example uh, of yeah working with continuous variable and we try to split it uh, like greater than the mean or or yeah or, or like uh, a value less uh, uh, yeah uh, smaller than than the mean or something like that and try to um, apply uh, such uh, this this methodology uh, to to other kind of, of variables yeah I, we can work with a continuous variable variable but we have to discreti uh, discreticize uh, the 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 variable yeah so you mean that yeah. uh, if you use all possible values of this continuous variable then the uh, the tree could be very deep or like uh... Oh, so, so it's also the question how to build this uh, tree in the in advance, right? How to... Yeah. Well, uh, you mean in continuous variable? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we have worked uh, with uh, only two levels. Like, uh, oh. yeah, try to 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 perform a. A small tree because you know maybe yeah if we want to uh, know if only need information uh, like if the value is uh, greater or not than 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 the mean for instance uh, maybe with such information you can uh, get a good prediction but we don't have a uh, yeah um, very complicated example in such uh, in such sense but it's true that uh, it can be applied for for yeah for continuous variable if we discretize oh. then yeah. okay thank you thank you very much for your reply thanks do we have any more questions okay paula Now you should be able to to unmute yourself, Paula. Excellent. Hopefully you can hear me. Yes. Great. Yes. Excellent. Quick question for for Amos. Thank you. That was a lovely, uh, interesting presentation. And um, if I understand correctly, you had a constraint on um, the ordinality, the number of. Um, uh, features or explanatory variables that are uh, um, selected. So you call that the complexity? Yeah, but uh, yeah, we uh, use that term um, when we talk about hierarchical categorical variables. Uh, then if, for instance, if we uh, want to consider a sparse solution also in other, uh, in the other variables, in continuous and, and yeah, categorical variables, uh, yeah, we can use, for instance, the lasso objective function and try to, to get a yeah, more sparse solution. But mm -hmm. yeah, for, when we use complexity is uh, when we deal with hierarchical categorical variables. But if we can, if we want to add the other sparsity, like the, the other one, we can try to yeah include that uh, in the in the adjective function. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good. Thank you. Yeah, very interesting. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Paula. Do we have more questions from the audience? Okay, so if it is not the case, uh, we have to say not goodbye, but see you next week for another talk uh, with Tias Gans. Thank you for everybody, for the speakers, the audience. See you. Thank you very, very much. Thank Thanks. you. Thank you to the speakers. Thank you so much.